All right, let's get started then. So, hello everyone. Uh, how is the conference, guys? It's going good. You, you, you are just after the lunch, feeling a bit sleepy. All right, so I will help you, try to help you with that. <laughs> me, me and coffee. Okay. So, low latency data processing in the era of serverless. Today we're going to uh, talk about serverless, a little bit about low latency. We'll try to figure out how we and whether we can do low latency data processing in using serverless. So, brief agenda for today. Uh, first, we will try to better understand uh, what is serverless, what does it bring to us as to software engineers, why industry goes serverless, then we will uh, uh, go over some specific problem like a low latency data processing, how we can do this in serverless, what are the common pitfalls, what you should know when you want your serverless application to perform uh, fast. And at the end, we are going to have some fun. We will have a, a demo of the practical solution, uh, which is using serverless architecture. So, hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, a little bit about me. So, uh, I'm already like m more than eight years in industry. Have been working on different positions from Java engineer to team lead and solution architect. Uh, besides that, I, I'm also a conference speaker and uh, a program committee, uh, committee member right there in, in, in the Vox Ukraine conference. And currently I'm working uh, at Hazelcast uh, as a cloud developer, uh, where me and my team, uh, some, some of the guys, by the way, are sitting uh, over there, uh, we are actively working on uh, moving our industry uh, to the cloud. Okay, by the way, uh, uh, who heard before about Hazelcast? Could you raise your hands? And who is using Hazelcast in production? All right, just <laughs> very few people. Okay, I think we will have to uh, uh, be there for, for a long time in this room. <laughs> All right, serverless. So, uh, First, this term was uh, uh, introduced uh, with the launch of Amazon Lambda Function Service in uh, 2014, and uh, it's oftenly it is associated with uh, Amazon Lambda Functions. But is it just Lambda Functions? So uh, soon we will uh, try to uh, learn more about it, and you will see that it's just it's it's not just Lambda Functions. So what do we call serverless? I, I really like to look at this in some historical perspective. So if we take the evolution of uh, uh, computing and cloud computing, all that started in uh, uh, early uh, 1940s with first supercomputers like ENIAC, who were used by uh, militaries. Then in 1960s, uh, mainframes uh, era began. Uh, at that time, uh, actually, such uh, huge companies like uh, IBM, uh, Hitachi, they were ruling the industry. Uh, and then, by the way, there, there is a really nice uh, quote of uh, uh, MIT uh, 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 professor Fernando Corbato uh, that, that, that you can often find in some literature. And in, in, in 1965, uh, they actually uh, predicted that uh, computer facilities in the future uh, will act like a power company or water company. So you will not have, like with a water company or power company, will, you will not have to build your own uh, power facilities or your own plant. Uh, you will use actually uh, power and water as a service. Okay, And uh, actually, as we see, that uh, prediction uh, had uh, a lot of sense because in 2004, uh, Amazon launched uh, their first service, SQ that was SQS, uh, and uh, that actually started the uh, era of clouds. Then in 10 years, as I said, uh, Amazon launched uh, uh, Amazon Lambda service, which actually uh, started... Uh, uh, the uh, evolution of serverless, we can say so. And uh, just recently, in 2019, um, University of uh, Berkeley uh, published a uh, quite interesting paper 
where they uh, reviewed uh, serverless and uh, did a prediction that just in 10 years it will have a very wide adoption. Why it is interesting? Because just 10 years ago, uh, same university published uh, a paper where they predicted the same thing about cloud computing. So it totally makes sense. So here on that timeline, uh, both clouds and serverless, they represent a cloud computing model. And what is cloud computing? Cloud computing is uh, actually, you, you, you can see of it as an on-demand delivery of uh, compute power, uh, database storage, application services on demand uh, via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. So you pay for what you use. So historically, this is what serverless is about. All right. So serverless applications uh, usually significantly use cloud-managed services. We call them backend as a services to manage server-side uh, uh, logic, state, flows, etc. So how does it look like uh, usually? So usually if you take some cloud applications, you, you have uh, traffic go uh, coming over the API gateway, which is then goes probably to some load balancer, which uh, distributes the load among uh, microservices fleet. And uh, at the backend, uh, instead of uh, setting up it on our own, uh, we use a uh, uh, database managed service, uh, user authentication as a service, queue as a service, etc., object storage as a service, which are managed by cloud providers. So this is backend as a services, right? Uh, serverless allows you to also allows you to run uh, your code in uh, stateless compute containers, which are called Lambda functions. And it is called uh, FAAS, like function as a service. Those Lambda functions are event triggered and fully managed by cloud provider. How does it usually work? So usually you have uh, a Lambda function that you program in some language. I don't know, Java, uh, Node.js, whatever. And you uh, implement some callback, which handles some specific event. This event can usually comes from infrastructure of a cloud provider. So what it can be? It can be event regarding the upload to object storage. So someone, user up uploaded uh, some file or video, you get event about this. And uh, wh wh what you do, you only implement a callback to process this event. For example, to encode it to some different format, right? Also, it can be HTTP event. So using Lambda functions, you can implement a complete uh, REST API if you subscribe it to, HT, uh, to API Gateway. We will, uh, soon we will see how, how it uh, works. Same you can do with a, a queue as a service, handle messages of the managed queue service instead of setting up your own queue cluster. And uh, there are some even more interesting cases like a, a scheduled event. For example, it can be event uh, which is uh, generated on some scheduled basis, on some rate or five minutes or cron schedule. So by doing this, you can do some periodical tasks or jobs, right? Uh, serverless allows you to operate at the higher level. You uh, can develop and run applications without thinking about the low level stuff. You don't have to choose a uh, type of the uh, bare metal server, uh, virtual machine, kind of the operation system, which uh, other uh, like uh, native packages to install, or how to configure your runtime, language runtime, etc. But uh, does it mean we have less servers? How 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 do you think? Like, uh, actually, that you should be aware that servers are still right there. Why so? Because you still can get uh, Lambda function, functions crashing, for example, because <laughs> there are servers under the hood. And even from my experience, I can tell that I just saw it uh, in the production when uh, we had API Gateway Lambda functions. We started getting errors from API Gateway, and we thought that this is some business logic that we implemented. But, for sh but it turned out that it was actually internals of the Lambda function service. So th does it mean uh, Lambda functions are bad? I wouldn't say so. But it means that you should uh, design your system, keeping in mind that something can go wrong. That's a common principle when you actually implement cloud applications, right? OK, so why industry goes serverless? Why we here today we are talking about that? So first uh, and very practical reason is that it allows you to lower your costs. So guys, uh, how do you think? What's the most expensive thing uh, currently in IT project, in IT industry? Any any thoughts? 
Of course, that's engineers. So I just a uh, couple of days ago talked to my friend. Uh, they, make, they are making some startup, and they are hosting in some cloud. They, 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 I, will, I will not say which exact cloud, but one of the th three major cloud providers. And uh, we were talking about their infrastructure. They have some servers which are performing calculations, some database managed server, uh, and some other things. And I, I asked him, how much does it cost in a month? It cost in a month. He told like, before we we were uh, paying three hundred of dollars, and now we optimized and we are paying one hundred of dollars in a month. So imagine like one hundred dollars in a month for infrastructure. Compare this to the developer rates. Like that's uncomparable stuff, right? So another thing is it is cloud native. What does it mean? Uh, both backend as a services and uh, Lambda functions, they come with a cloud discovery. When you invoke Lambda function, you don't have to do discovery on your own. Uh, it comes with a high availability because uh, actually you will have another copies of Lambda functions to handle your events. Uh, as well as fault tolerance, uh, monitoring and other cloud native things that we uh, got used to. Right uh, nowadays, uh, it significantly reduces time to market. Okay, so again, another big, 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 big thing because uh, right, so uh, uh, you can uh, uh, focus on the result, f focus more on the result. You can deliver faster, uh, get faster feedback about your job of, uh, as uh, as of job of the software engineer. So that also makes sense, and it makes your system less complex. Okay, if you, for example, use Lambda functions, you don't have to do uh, to uh, implement provisioning for your infrastructure. So less code, less uh, complex system, less time to uh, uh, support it, and uh, actually uh, less, probably less bugs, but not, not often the case, of course. Uh, okay, so now we just uh, uh, went over the serverless overall, this term, what it is. And uh, uh, now let's talk more about one, one of specific uh, problems, low latency data processing, okay? So can, can we do this in serverless? So uh, firstly, let's uh, see the typical scenarios of low, la uh, low level data, uh, low, low latency uh, data processing. So, which first thing which comes to my mind is uh, algorithmic training, trading in the financial markets. So, uh, some typical uh, problems there are to an quickly analyze uh, state at the market and uh, decide whether to buy stock options or not. Right. So, and it should be done in some uh, in in the rate of milliseconds. Uh, Real-time bidding for ads. Another typical example, when you open some uh, page with Google Ads, under the hood it performs some uh, bidding. It uh, bids uh, uh, ad providers, chooses the best matching uh, ad provider, the cheapest probably uh, ad provider. And it's done also in a rate of milliseconds. Okay, Fraud detection for the in-flight transaction that makes sense so when you pay for something or do some transfer under the hood your bank or, or another financial institutions it checks for uh, signs of fraud in your transaction right uh, personalized user experience in e-commerce or somewhere else so uh, again uh, it's a very common thing uh, nowadays to analyze user behavior to uh, quickly analyze uh, every user click to decide uh, which ad to show which product to recommend and it it is usually done using some stream processing, and it's also uh, uh, fr this problem is from the family of low latency data problems. Okay, what usually brings uh, the latency in serverless? So let's first uh, see the lambda function lifecycle. So uh, for all starts with the very first request, which triggers a call start of the lambda function. So during the call start. Under the hood, uh, uh, Lambda function engine uh, does a lot, lots of job. So usually cloud providers use uh, under the hood some uh, micro container engine. And what it does, it provisions this container. It initializes uh, provisions, actually means that install all the packages that it needs. It initializes uh, language runtime. Then comes, it comes to the, your application startup, which in some languages, as we can guess, 
can take some time, uh, and so on. So it's very expensive. Then uh, next requests come, and on every request we go over two stages. This is freezing and uh, thawing. So what does it mean? So after we uh, get request, we uh, process request, the whole state of the Lambda function freezes. All the background threads or processes, they are freezed. They are not scheduled on the compute power uh, facilities of the cloud provider. So you, you can think of it like uh, your process is still there, but it is no, no threads are running. They are just post. And just when the next request comes, they are thought, like uh, they are uh, resumed. Okay, so that also brings some uh, can bring some slowness. And uh, termination. So uh, there are different policies, but uh, you, you should expect that at every moment your function can be terminated, instance of your function. Why so? First, because of time. Because uh, usually uh, most of the cloud providers guarantee that Lambda function will run for not, not more than five minutes. That's one thing. So after five minutes, it can be descheduled and terminated. Uh, another thing is that, again, don't forget that you run in shared in infrastructure. So that means cloud provider can get uh, some load spike uh, to, for the, to the Lambda functions uh, used by other customers. And it simply will cause this terminating of your Lambda functions, which possibly uh, are not handling uh, traffic at the moment. right? So as we see, at least three major parts can bring the latency over there. So it's a cold start which from time to time can bring the latency. This is uh, background processes and the uh, threads freezing because uh, no, you no longer can do some health checking to check for the uh, like a database uh, to, like a cl cluster state or something. So you cannot rely on it and termination. You cannot uh, 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 rely on some uh, store that you saved into the memory. Uh, what are the approaches to optimize it? So uh, the very common approach nowadays is making periodic requests to keep uh, the function alive. So usually you uh, uh, so somewhere you uh, put a keep alive service. It can be uh, like uh, some uh, service of the cloud provider or it can be another Lambda function or some agent that you implement. And this agent sends specific events to your Lambda function. Those events mean means just keep alive. Right, so, and with that we eliminate a chance that our function will be uh, terminated in five minutes time. We actually decrease it. Uh, and by the way, usually it doesn't make sense uh, to do to send those requests uh, more often than five minutes. That's a common recommendation that uh, uh, all all cloud providers have. Pre-allocating memory for CPU-bound tasks. So if you are doing some encoding, decoding, or some uh, encryption stuff, things like that, you should keep in mind that uh, Lambda function performance, CPU performance, is bound to the memory that you allocated. And for example, if you allocate more memory, and I know that in AWS, if you uh, allocate more than 1.8 uh, 1 .8 gigabyte of uh, memory, you will get multi-core Lambda function. So that means if you pre-allocate more memory, Lambda function will complete faster. What does it mean to us? We will pay less because uh, in uh, function as a services, we pay for processing time. Uh, use another important uh, point is how you uh, deploy your services. If we take some uh, cloud application which uses which are which is using backend as a services like object store managed database etc lambda function api gateway you need to make sure that you deploy them as close as possible to each other. That means they should be placed in the same uh, region of cloud provider in the same availability zone. What does it mean availability zone? That's actually different parts of the data center which have their own power facilities, uh, networking facilities for uh, high availability or even in the same network. So cloud providers also allow, for example, to place Lambda function inside of the uh, network where your like uh, containers or uh, virtual machines instances are running. So it can be collocated by, but you should also uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, in Amazon, for example, if you uh, uh, place Lambda function in, in VPC, it can, uh, you can get some uh, performance degrees. Uh, caching hot data in the external in-memory store. So 
as we just talked, um, uh, you cannot rely on uh, internal state inside of your lambda function. You, of course, you can precache something, but after ter termination, it gets lost. And and of course, sometimes uh, the state that you need, hot data that you usually need to access, what we call hot data, is uh, read mostly data, which is rarely updated. That we need to do some calculations. Uh, it can it, it can simply not fit into your memory of lambda function. So in this case, we go for external memory store. So what we do is we simply uh, connect from our lambda function to in-memory store, cache some results, use them for the next processing, and optimize our calculations like that. Why in-memory store? So there is a really nice cheat sheet uh, called latency numbers every programmer uh, should know. And... Uh, if you, as you can see here, like one megabyte sequential read from the disk is about one millisecond, okay? Let's compare it to SSD. It will be already around like at the rate of 100 microseconds, okay? But if you work with the memory, so one mega, mega, megabyte sequential read from the uh, memory is about a few microseconds. So generally, I would say that we, we should get used to the fact that microsecond is a new millisecond, okay? So this is why we uh, we usually use in-memory stores to save a state of the lambda function. So we just covered different ways to optimize uh, uh, co com computations in lambda functions. Now it's time to see how those approaches are applied in a real life uh, uh, real life uh, application. So we are going to have a demo. What is our demo about? So we are going to review a fraud detection problem, a simplified one, where we, we, we are going to have a bank of Hazelcast, uh, which uh, handles uh, only a specific subset of the transactions, transactions performed at airports. So and uh, uh, at the back end, uh, services of this uh, bank will uh, uh, will be trying to figure out whether this transa transaction has any signs of fraud or not. So how we will be doing this? So imagine that we have two transactions, A and B, one performed at London, in London and another one in Paris at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. So based on the coordinates that come, uh, based on the airport coordinates and time, we will try to figure out wh whether it was realistic for the user to move from London to Paris in uh, just two hours, right? For this example, we, for example, we'll decide that it's so, it, it looks normal. But if it will be just two hours between two transactions, one of which is performed in London and another one performed in Sydney, we will decide that this is actually a suspicious transaction. So, such a... Uh, 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 fraud detection uh, logic. So let's review our serverless solution design. So uh, we are going to have two lambda functions. Fun la first lambda function will be triggered by uploads uh, into S3. Amazon S3 is an object storage service. Uh, we will upload there uh, mostly static data with A reports data. And this lambda function will take data from S3 once it receives event about upload and copy, the, copy it into Hazelcast Cloud, into Hazelcast Cloud cluster. Another Lambda function will be, will be subscribed to API Gateway, will be receiving HTTP events uh, from it. So here we will implement actually our fraud detection API. So this API will, uh, the implementation will resign in Amazon Lambda and this Amazon Lambda will uh, take uh, data from the request. Uh, we'll also use uh, data, uh, airports data that we have in the cluster, and we'll decide whether it's fraud detection or not. And also, we will have a CloudWatch events uh, configured to uh, for to send uh, a keep alive message to our Lambda function every five minutes to keep it alive in order to prevent termination. Okay. So here, as you see, we used the uh, Hazelcast Cloud. Uh, why we choose Hazelcast Cloud there? So uh, Hazelcast Cloud is a, a managed service for Hazelcast in-memory data grid. So for those of you who didn't work with Hazelcast, 
his Hazel custom memory data grid, uh, uh, you can think of it as a distributed cache uh, clustered, uh, which is storing uh, data in memory, uh, which allows you to do uh, calculations, querying of that cache. Plus, uh, it also uh, provides many, many more features like uh, concurrent primitives, which work in the cluster. For example, you can use distributed log, distributed uh, semaphore, or anything else. So this is a managed service for in-memory data grid. Uh, it, is, uh, it allows you to create a cluster which is collocated with your Amazon infrastructure in the same uh, VPC, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, in the same region, uh, in the same availability zone. Here, by the way, you can see some benchmarks. It comes with a full uh, feature security pack. It means we have uh, encryption for data transfer and other things. And it is Lambda ready, so it's really easy to use it with Amazon Lambda, and we will just see it uh, very soon. So let's, let's see how it works. Okay. All right. So uh, first, let's see the infrastructure that I prepared in AWS. So what we have here, we have here two uh, Lambda functions. Uh, can, do, do do you see what's what's on there? Everybody can read. Okay, cool. So uh, the first function is the cloud demo validate function, the one which implements. Uh, uh, fraud detection business logic. So as you can see, it is subscribed to API Gateway to receive API requests and subscribe to CloudWatch events to receive those keep alive uh, messages. I will see just uh, in the code how it is implemented. And another Lambda function, uh, S3 function, which is uh, subscribed to S3 bucket to handle airports data, okay? Uh, uh, let me also show you API Gateway. How did we connect it to Lambda function? So here is my uh, validate API. So I expect a post request to slash validate resource. And this slash validate resource is uh, integrated with my Lambda function. So right here, I specify that I want requests which come to API Gateway, post request to trigger my Lambda function. Okay. All this can be automated using command line or some uh, Terraform, but here I just showing you to it on the UI because it's just easier to understand, uh, probably. Uh, what else we have is, as I said, we have a, a Cloud uh, Watch Events uh, Warmer. In Amazon, you have a Cloud Watch service which allows you to do some scheduled events. So here I cre created Cloud Demo Validate Warmer. Uh, event rule, which every five minutes, every five minutes, it calls my Lambda function, validate function, with a very simple JSON type keep alive. Okay, so it, to, it this is to keep alive uh, uh, our Lambda function. And uh, now uh, what we need to do next is uh, we have to uh, create our Hazelcast Cloud cluster to, in order to get to get our demo working. So uh, this is a, a public uh, web console of Hazelcast Cloud. So what we are going to do, we are going to create a new account very soon, very quickly. So let me use my demo email. So it's cherkas.demo plus devoxua gmail.com. OK. Uh, Nazari. Password. Company Hazelcast. Country Ukraine. Agree. Okay, so I just signed up. So here I get email to uh, sorry. Here I get email to verify my email. Okay. Ah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. 
Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Thank, thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, so verification succeeded. And now we are able to log in. So let's log in. And Schema uh, Evox UA. Then let's sign up. OK, so here how our web console UI uh, look like. So uh, here, by the way, if you decide to register, uh, we, it already comes with a $50 uh, trial that you can use to, to play with uh, uh, Hazelcast Cloud uh, clusters. So I'm going to create a new cluster. So let's, let's name it. Let's call it test. Then I select cloud provider. Uh, I can select select region here. Let's leave the default one. Then uh, I have a choice of different cluster types. So uh, we have a free cluster type. This is up to 200 megabytes uh, 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 cluster with one member, with one cluster member that it's, you can use for free. And also we have other paid paid uh, cluster types that, that you can, by the way, also use if you leverage this $50 trial. Uh, so I select small cluster uh, with two gigabytes of memory. I can increase it if I need. Or I can, for example, choose enable auto scaling so it will uh, grow along with my, uh, as I write data into the cluster. Uh, I can choose persistence so that uh, data in my cluster, as you remember, Hazelcast stores data in memory. So data in my, in my cluster will, uh, will be saved into persistent store between cluster restarts. If I stop cluster, start again, data will be still there. And uh, I can do some map configuration. For those of you who worked with Hazelcast, it can be uh, familiar because um, this is actually the configs that you do when you work with Hazelcast data structures. Here I'm going to configure distributed map. What is distributed map? So actually, if you use Java client, Hazelcast Java client, this is Java map, which is, which is distributed in the cluster. Same API, but distributed in the cluster. And I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to configure a user's map. So user's map stores uh, uh, data that I get from requests. And I'm going to specify uh, time to leave of about, uh, uh, mm, for example, uh, if we want, uh, let's put uh, 12 hours. So uh, that means after uh, time to leave, uh, is passed, our data automatically gets evicted. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, create. And uh, what I do next is I trigger cluster creation. So what happens under the hood now is uh, uh, in our public infrastructure, Hazelcast Cloud public infrastructure, uh, we uh, allocate uh, resources in, in uh, we use, by the way, uh, uh, intensively use Kubernetes under the hood. We allocate resources to build uh, your cluster. So while it's doing that, it should be very fast, by the way, uh, I'm going to go over the code quickly to show you how, how, how does the, the stuff look like. Yeah, let, let me increase. By the way, I saw that you are showing me five minutes. So I just got a little bit afraid. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, so uh, what do we have here? I will just increase very soon the code. So I have a Spring Cloud function project. So there is a uh, Spring Cloud module uh, f to build uh, serverless applications. and. Uh, by the way, very the overall uh, co code base of the Spring Cloud function application very similar to boot application. So what I have here is uh, uh, different bins. Uh, one is uh, Hazelcast client, Java Hazelcast client, which is configured to work with my cluster. So here I will just quickly, uh, once my cluster starts, I will specify those properties here. This is discovery token uh, uh, and uh, uh, other things like uh, cluster name, cluster password. Another bin I have is a uh, uh, Hazelcast uh, users map that I need to do a fraud detection. So how I build it is uh, actually I just use Hazelcast uh, client instance and I just uh, uh, create a map instance using giving it a name. 
Okay, and this he, uh, uh, this map instance uh, implements IMAP, which actually extends Java util map interface. Similar thing for airports map, and uh, being for Amazon S3 to be able to copy data from S3 to map. Okay, so this is our cloud function application. Uh, now let's see uh, the functions. So here is my S3 function. That's just that's the the whole the whole code that I have, right? So you, as you can see, I don't have here a code to uh, create a web application. Nothing. Just my handler, which gets a three event. So what I do, I get this S3 event. I uh, read it from uh, Amazon S3, and then I pass to copy to airports map method, where I simply uh, copy this uh, JSON data uh, from uh, S3 object to my map. I use put all method on my map, okay? And my validate function. So how does my validate function work? So it's a bit more complicated comparing to S3 function. So here I have two types of events. One type of event is validate, another one is keep alive. So if we get keep alive request, we just do nothing. Because we need, this request is just to uh, to prevent termination of the lambda function, okay? So this is actually this request with the type field, keep alive, okay? So those requests, by the way, are serialized into JSON, so nothing uh, complicated here. And another type of event is apply validate request. So I get validate request. Validate request comes with user ID, airport code, and timestamp, okay? So what I do next? I see, I, uh, look, I'm searching for the user. If I already have this, uh, you, uh, any data for this user in my map, okay? I, again, use Java. I'm using mostly Java util map API, get by key. Uh, if I don't have it, I simply store it for further validations, okay? If I have it, I retrieve data about uh, incoming request airport and about the previous transaction airport, okay? So what is airport data? Airport data is actually a model that has a airport code, description, latitude, and longitude. So basically coordinates, okay? So what I do next, I take transaction time and trying to figure out time between those two transactions, current and previous. Then I use a harvesting uh, formula since I have uh, airport uh, coordinates for previous airport and current airport, I uh, calculate distance between those two airports. And then I have uh, distance and time. I uh, calculate speed, and I am trying to, fi to figure out whether this speed is, uh, uh, is, is uh, bigger than the typical airplane sp speed or not. Like if it's more than that, like more than uh, uh, 800 kilometers per hour, then I decide that this transaction is uh, suspicious. If it's below that, then I decide that transaction uh, look fine, okay? So I do this simple check and then I uh, store this request data for uh, for the next validations. So I update user data. So I store, like, uh, uh, replace uh, my current re request becomes uh, my previous request, okay? So I s switch that, store uh, into user's map. All right, so, and here, just the uh, implementation of harvesting formula, okay? So that's actually how our code looks like. So I just make an executable jar out of it and deploy it to the uh, Lambda function. I already did that, just uh, not to spend the time on it. So what I need to do now? Now I need to... So here I have Lambda functions that are configured uh, to work with uh, uh, another cluster. Actually, the cluster that I used during my previous demo. Okay. So Lambda functions usually are configured using environment variables. And if you use UI, here you specify those environment variables. Now I need to reconfigure both Lambda functions to work with new cluster. So how I do this? Here, as you can see, our cluster is already running. So here th there is a button 
configure client. Here you can download a ready code sample for Java, Python, Node.js, Golang with the code which is already working with this cluster. But we will not do like this. What, what we will do instead, we will uh, actually configure a connection to cluster just inside our Lambda function. So what I need to have is I need to have a password. So let me reorganize it a bit. So here I prepared a simple script to update Lambda function config. So what I need to do is export. So I need to export three environment variables, cluster name, password, and discovery token. Cluster name is the same test. And uh, for the password, I use new one. And uh, for the discovery token, again, I copy it from there. Okay, so I copied it and discovery token. Okay, I exported those environment variables and now I just run my script to update function configuration. And after it updated, it will test if uh, connection from Lambda function to uh, my cluster work fine. <coughs> it works fine, as we can see. So what I'm going to do now, uh, here, as you could see, I, I shown you this uh, keep, alive, uh, war, uh, keep alive rule. And it is disabled. It was disabled. So I will enable it so that this uh, uh, CloudWatch service uh, starts sending uh, keep alive messages with this JSON to my Lambda function. So actually, I will do this just using AWS CLI. So I just uh, run AWS events enable rule and my, my rule name. So this is probably usually how you do this if you have some motivation like uh, uh, Terraform or something else. So it is now enabled, as you can see. Okay. And uh, what we are going to do, so what we have so far, we have reconfigured our two Lambda functions. Uh, we have enabled our uh, keep alive warmer rule. And uh, what we need to do to uh, show the whole end to end flow running, we need to upload a reports data to S3 bucket. Okay. So here is my S3 bucket data. So like uh, uh, JSON, Q, yeah. So this is the format of my airport's data. So airport code with uh, uh, coordinates and the name. So w w let's see if we have anything in our S3 bucket for now. So I run S3 LS. So I have a uh, data inside. So let me remove it. Okay, so S3 REM airports JSON. Now let me copy it again to trigger Lambda function. So S3 CP airports JSON to S3 bucket. Yeah, so we just uploaded it. And now let's see, let's go to uh, Lambda function S3, S3 Lambda function. And uh, let's see, let's see the logs. Let's rerun the function. And here are my fresh logs. And as you can see, let me, uh, it's not that easy to do, probably. Yeah, so here it is uh, connecting to my cluster. Okay. It actually shows uh, logs with some uh, delay. It's not re real time, right? Because all that already executed. So, and at the end, it, it shows that log output, S3 bucket and bucket name. And this is actually the code that we uh, have uh, in our S3 function. Okay. Here. Okay. And uh, so it worked. Uh, this. Now we have our data, airports data in Hazelcast cluster. So if I go to Hazelcast cluster, I can see uh, two new maps, users and airports. And I can see that it will just start arriving soon. Uh, Mm -hmm. 
Ah, yeah, I need to choose airports, of course. Yeah, so you, as you can see, some data got imported. We have 24 airports, not, not so many, just for demo purpose. So it was imported to my map. So this JSON data inside my map now. So what I do now is uh, I need to actually call, let's, let's call our validate API and see how this fraud detection works. So uh, I prepared a simple scenario for it. So code. So here is uh, my, rest, my API that I'm going to execute. Here is address of API gateway. Then goes validate slash validate resource and uh, JSON fields. Type of the request validate, user ID one. And here I'm going to specify uh, Lviv airport because I'm from, from Lviv. And uh, I'm going to, uh, so usually at Hazelcast, almost every quarter we have uh, engineering meetups at Istanbul. We have R&D office over there. And uh, uh, usually I fly from Lviv to Istanbul. And uh, this, this flight often is, is around uh, 6 uh, p.m. So let's imagine that I had have some coffee in Lviv airport, okay? So here I specified uh, uh, transaction timestamp, uh, airport code, user ID, and so on. Let's call it. So it tells user data saved for future validations because there, there was no data before, right? So what I do next is, uh, okay, I arrived to uh, Istanbul airport. Usually I arrived to, to Asia side because our office at Asia side, this is Sabiha airport, not this new, uh, the biggest in the world airport. So I haven't been there. It should be, I, I think, very cool. And uh, let's, let's now perform transaction from Sabiha airport in Istanbul. Let's imagine that I arrived there and I, I don't know, come, get, come to Starbucks and uh, bought some water. Because uh, I don't drink coffee when it's too late. Uh, okay, so I specify Sabiha airport code and I specify uh, like uh, 10, 10, uh, 10 p.m. because usually I arrive at 10 p.m. Okay, and yeah. So it tells the transaction is fine because yeah, actually it takes about around two hours to to get from Lviv to Istanbul. Now let's imagine that uh, somehow a uh, bank gets another transaction from Sydney, just in I don't know, in 15 minutes. Okay. So what we get there? As you can see, transaction is suspicious because it calculated distance between Sydney and Istanbul, then uh, calculated time between two transactions and uh, decided that it is tr suspicious transaction. Right? Uh, so that's actually it for the demo. Uh, sorry, let's go here. And let's have some sum up. So what we just seen during this presentation. So serverless is a perfect uh, choice if you want to move fast, okay? So as you could see, again, we did some simplified uh, solution, but it was distributed using various services and the, 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 code, base the code base was really small. Uh, you can do low latency processing in serverless, but be aware of the common pitfalls and know uh, the ways to prevent those issues. You need to think about high availability and latency when you choose uh, external storage in uh, Lambda functions, because if you would choose some SQL server, you, have, you would have to uh, somehow manage a connection pool and imagine how would you ma manage connection pools to SQL server if your Lambda function can be terminated at any moment. Uh, another good uh, uh, outcome is that uh, using in-memory computing, like in external memory stores, allows you to save your money because uh, the less latency you have, the less processing time, the less you pay for the service. And again, uh, guys, uh, I encourage you to come to our public uh, web console uh, and uh, play with our service. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, I, I'm ready to hear your questions if you have any.
in Mac Hazelcast. So how much uh, time do you spend uh, calling Hazelcast? And yeah, let's you let's you compare see. that to like something like Elasticsearch. Uh, uh, actually, I can't in, in uh, Amazon hosted service. Uh, I, I didn't compare to Elasticsearch personally, but I just uh, recently did uh, uh, benchmarking uh, that as a part of my work in the team, and uh, I was getting uh, uh, for for for, for read. Uh, th of course, it's just my benchmark, but for read transactions for Hazelcast Cloud uh, cluster, I was getting about uh, 200 of microseconds, and for fr for write transaction, about six to eight hundred of microseconds. So so r rates like that. That but that's again my personal benchmark and. Uh, you know, benchmarking is a thing that uh, I can uh, make a benchmark with, which can show that something works slow and <laughs> and opposite, <laughs> right? Okay, guys, uh, if you don't have any other questions, uh, then I can guess that you understand everything that I showed in the demo, which is cool. <laughs> okay, thank you so much again. And uh, enjoy, enjoy the Vox conference.